From the dawn of history, man has reported visitors from other planets. In ancient societies, they were feared. In pagan societies, they were revered as gods. But in modern times, we've tried to ignore them. Do they continue their visits? Have they reached out to us? Are they in fact in league with the governments of the earth, even as we speak? These questions and more will be answered on volume one of UFO Investigations, The Cover-Up. And now your hosts, True Hawkins and Joan Piercy. Hello, we're UFO Investigations. I'm True Hawkins, and this is research associate, Jody Piercy. Hello. Our continuing job is to bring information to you from recently acquired government documents acquired through the Freedom of Information Act and information from civilian investigators. It's our continuing goal to compile and bring you information as it becomes available. Now, this first video report will serve as a rather broad overview and history of investigations starting right after World War II. Now, to begin with, do UFOs and extraterrestrial beings exist? Well, Jody has a group of government documents that would certainly lead one to believe that this is the case. Jody? Thank you, True. Our first set of documents to review are very interesting. The first, letter from General Nathan Twining, Commander, Air Material Command, September 23rd, 1947. The subject, Opinion of the Commander, Air Material Command, on flying discs. Documents show that the flying discs were starting to be examined by certain factions in the military who apparently had been aware of the discs for some time. Document shows that the discs were real and not someone's imagination. Document shows that General Twining decided not to tell about the disc crashes that had started to occur with the subsequent recovery of both alien bodies and the bodies of Army Air Force pilots. The document illustrates that the RAND Corporation had a very early involvement with the subject. The letter was written in the same time period that President Truman decided to establish a separate effort to deal solely with the alien problem. The second document, also a government document, dated 1950, has four points that are very, very much along the lines of what we've been talking about. One, the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the H-bomb. B, flying saucers exist. C. Their modus operandi is unknown, but concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush, one of the original MJ-12 members. And D. The entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance. This document went to interagencies throughout the U.S. and Canada. Fascinating reading. Now, what about UFO sightings? Let's take a look at some video and still pictures. You be the judge. was just a small example of the thousands of sightings reported over the last few years. We do need to apologize for the quality of some of the pictures and video you saw. They were shot unexpectedly, some with home equipment, and in many cases under adverse conditions at night or clouds. Now, in many cases, research material arrived at our offices from unknown origins, totally unidentified. In certain cases, the sender specifically requested to remain anonymous. For instance, a government document, or presidential memo, if you will, from President Truman to President-elect Eisenhower. Jody, give us details of this famous Truman document. As you have pointed out, True, information about UFOs and aliens oftentimes surfaces totally anonymously. The Truman document, for instance, 
dated 1952. It's a briefing document for Eisenhower from President Truman. It involves discussion of the Majestic 12, the Roswell crash, sightings in 1947 over Mount Rainier, and this particular document arrived in an unmarked envelope at the home of a noted UFO researcher in 1987. The pages were recorded on eight exposures of 35 millimeter film. Much of the information that we receive actually comes from government employees and undercover civilian investigators. These people feed information and in many cases lead investigators to classified material recently made available through the Freedom of Information Act. Now these undercover employees and investigators have their own reasons for not coming forward. Sometimes they fear ridicule. Sometimes they fear they'll lose their job. Sometimes they're even afraid for the safety of themselves and their families. In most cases, it appears to us, as we did our research, that it's a cry for help in solving a problem they see as being very serious. As we compiled this, an up-and-coming video report, we were so impressed of the caliber of people actively involved in UFO research, people from high-level government service, the sciences, and the private sector. Now, on one side of the coin, we have dedicated, resourceful investigators. On the other, government spokespersons and military personnel maintaining an ongoing effort to discredit any UFO research. Let's take a look now at two very credible researchers as they were interviewed by PM Magazine in Salt Lake City. People are being used for food. The aliens are eating us. Uh, people, uh, they're experimenting with us. Uh, horrible, unspeakable experimentations. John Lear's is an unbelievable story. He's certain that we have been invaded by an alien culture, that they are experimenting on us, and that the U.S. government knows about it. In fact, it's their most guarded, top secret. It all began on a hot July night in 1947, when, according to Lear and others, an alien craft crashed on a remote ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. Eyewitnesses, the local papers, even the first military men at the site reported a crashed UFO. Then, suddenly the top brass swarmed to the site. Witnesses were sworn to secrecy and every speck of debris was literally vacuumed from the dusty desert floor. A new story was issued. It, said military officials, was nothing more than a crashed weather balloon. William Moore has written a book on the Roswell incident. Uh, we know that it was not a weather balloon. The people who gave out that story have since come forth and said it was nothing more than a fabrication to get the press off their backs. The evidence suggests it was a spacecraft, and the evidence suggests the government grabbed it and uh, carted it away and is still involved with the examination of it. Now, just imagine the people the responsible for our government looking at this thing and also realizing that only t nine years earlier in 1938 thousands of people have been panicked by the H.G. Wells presentation of War of the Worlds and just imagine what these people thought when they were faced with this the reality of the thing it was just absolutely important of, of just absolutely world-shaking, earth-shattering importance this thing be kept secret forever and ever. In fact, government documents unearthed via the Freedom of Information Act suggest that both craft and alien bodies had been retrieved. However, references are vague and large portions of the text have been censored. What is known is that in 1947, the United States Air Force began a series of codenamed projects set up to monitor UFOs. The truth of the matter is, since 1947, we have collected and have in our possession at least uh, 30 to 35 extraterrestrial flying saucers. We have collected and have in our possession at least uh, 100 to 150 alien bodies representing at least three different species that uh, people are being abducted uh, at a uh, unprecedented rate. Lear goes so far as to claim that the U.S. government has established communication with this alien power and actually collaborated with them. We have even built underground research facilities in top secret areas to house their little gray scientists. The ones that I know for sure that exist are the ones in Nevada at Area 51. There is a uh, underground alien base there. 
It's uh, our nation's uh, most secret operational facility, and that's where they fly the extraterrestrial craft out of. Now, says Lear, they have run amok. They are out of control, and they are not benevolent. Our government realizes it made a horrible mistake and can do nothing about it. Moore believes that it's not the aliens, but John Lear who's run amok, and he's outraged by his stories. Moore himself has spent years carefully and meticulously researching the UFO phenomena, proving he believes that UFOs exist, visit Earth regularly, and our government knows about it, and for unknown reasons is maintaining a massive cover-up. Stories like Lear's, he says, only discredit the truth. John Lear called me up one time and was uh, uh, absolutely certain that he was about to be uh, captured and eaten by aliens. All I can say is my sources go right to the very top, and if it were not true, I would not be risking my credibility and my life <clears throat> to come forward with this information. There is no doubt that Lear understands the inner workings of the U.S. intelligence community. He's the son of late aerospace pioneer Bill Lear, and for years flew covert missions over Laos for the CIA. He has done nothing but collect uh, the most outrageous rumor mill stories that are floating around on the grapevine. Bill Moore is uh, one of the most hard-working, credible people in this UFO field. He has probably done more to expose the cover-up than any other single individual. But, says Lear, Moore may be working with the government and only exposing parts of the truth, parts aimed to mislead the truth seekers. All of which is, is totally false. Alien invaders, government agents, secret informants, hoaxes or scams? A cover-up like no other? Is this science fiction at its finest or reality beyond our wildest imaginations? Has John Lear stepped off the deep end? It's not important that uh, you believe this now, but to file it away for future reference in a month, a year, maybe two years, you'll look back on this when the truth finally gets out and you'll say, my gosh, the son of a gun was right. Some startling information posed by top-level researchers. The difference being that Bill Moore, the man with the beard you saw, has admitted to participating in a government disinformation campaign to throw researchers like John Lear off the trail. And we found it kind of interesting in our research. If UFOs don't exist, then why is the government participating in disinformation about UFOs? You might even ask, how does a man with John Lear's background and prominence become so actively involved in UFO investigations? We find out during an interview with award-winning broadcast journalist George Knapp of KLAS-TV in Las Vegas. Three years ago, when uh, I had a friend of mine come to Nellis Air Force Base, who I had flown with in Laos, I flew for a private company over there, and he flew for uh, uh, um, the ambassador. He was a raven and uh, uh, really knew him very well. He came through here about three years ago and uh, in the process of asking him where uh, all he had been in the uh, past few years, he mentioned he was at Bentwaters. And Bentwaters was, of course, the site of a very famous flying saucer landing in 1980. And I said, uh, oh, well, that's, that's supposedly where that flying saucer landed. And he said, uh, no, John, not supposedly uh, it did. I didn't see it because I was confined to quarters, but I will give you the names of the guys who did and gave me General Gordon Williams, uh, Colonel Chuck Hall, Major Ted Conrad. He said, if you ever see these guys, they'll tell you. And I said, you mean all this stuff is true? There are aliens and flying saucers? And he said, I hope to tell you. So that's when I set out on this thing to find out what the bottom line was. And uh, so what I've been talking to you about uh, over the past couple of years is what I keep finding out. And uh, we're getting closer and closer to the truth. Lear's not the only one formerly with the government intelligence community. Bill Cooper, a former Navy man, describes the incident that turned him onto UFO research during a subsequent interview with Knapp and Lear. In the Navy, I had an occasion to actually see uh, what they call a UFO, only this was certainly not unidentified. The only thing that I could tell about it that was unidentified is we didn't know who was flying it. I was on a submarine on the surface between Pearl Harbor and uh, the Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington area. What did it look like? What, what did you see? It was a huge um, 
absolutely, you know, without a doubt, metal machine, which had been built by someone somewhere, came up out of the water, tumbled end over end, and went up into the clouds. It was low cloud cover that day. Uh, there were three personnel on the conning tower, myself, the starboard lookout, and the officer of the deck. His name was Ensign Ball. You all saw it. They all saw it. Captain was called to the bridge. He came up, followed by the chief quartermaster, who brought a 35-millimeter camera. Uh, the craft, or another craft that looked exactly like it, came back down out of the clouds, again, tumbling end over end, went into the water. Uh, and the whole thing was incredible. I was absolutely uh, stunned. But it was obvious that it was metal, it was a machine, it did not glow like the normal uh, accounts of... Um, Meteors or something like no. that. No. Uh, and pictures were taken. When we uh, arrived back in port, um, we were debriefed by uh, Office of Naval Intelligence officer who basically the gist of the debriefing was, was you didn't see anything and you're not going to talk about anything and if you do you're going to be in deep trouble. So that was the end of that. Now, both Lear and Cooper are now conducting their research in the open, exposing themselves to whatever consequences may come their way. Here in our studio, we have a guest who, for many reasons, can't be identified. We'll call him by his pen name, Richard K. Wilson. He has compiled an extensive collection of research material and is the author of the book, The Secret Treaty. Now, Mr. Wilson, how did you get started in this research? It happened about 20 years ago. Um, I began to notice the the presence of uh, of discs and read all the literature and started talking to some intelligence people looking at documents that that uh, came by and I started to uncover together with a lot of bunch of other people uh, quite a lot of data regarding uh, what appeared to be quite a large cover up. Mr. Wilson, I uh, I have four pages of uh, different names, codes, starting with Majestic and uh, four other various pages that go on from there. Could you give us a chronological order of how some of these agencies, one became the other perhaps, or what exactly some of their meanings may be? In 1947, when the Roswell crash happened, the United States uh, put together a group of people to go and look into this. They weren't sure whether they came from the Germans or they came from the Soviets, uh, where they suspected uh, some additional technology was being developed after the war. During the war, the United States and the Soviets, as well as the Canadians, acquired disk data. In 1947, there was a specific incident where the radar at the Four Corners area in the Midwest took down a disk uh, thereafter known as the Roswell crash. On that disk, uh, the United States government discovered both alien bodies of a reptilian species and also the bodies of Air Force pilots. This in itself, besides the technological surprise, was enough to keep them uh, in the data secret. In September of 47, Truman passed the National Security Act in order to hide the activities of the government, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the alien problem. In 1948, Project Sign was established after a top-secret estimate of the situation was prepared. General Hoyt Vandenberg, after reviewing the report, ordered it destroyed. Not all copies were destroyed. One still survives. Project Sign was designated as Project Grudge in December 1948, with a public version to be known as Project Blue Book. The liaison between Project Grudge and Project Blue Book was Captain Edward Ruppelt. 1949 was a time period in which alien craft were seen hovering over sensitive nuclear installations, especially in New Mexico. In December 1950, they established a unit called IPU, Interplanetary Phenomena Unit, which established operationally scenarios to be able to deal with the increasing problem of crash disks and aliens. By this time, they had approximately 16 crash disks and 65 alien bodies, one of which was live and they had held in a facility. They termed the alien EBE, which means extraterrestrial biological entity, a name coined by Dr. Della Block, who was also a member of the original study group. Uh, the government has pursued various scenarios, some of which are being implemented at this moment to try to acclimate the public toward a lot of the 
these different events that are about to occur. Just how secret is all of this? As Wilbur Smith indicated in his letter to Dr. Sarbacher in 1950, this matter is so highly classified because of its impact on every living being on this planet, it's classified higher than the H-bomb was. In fact, they've developed at least 32 levels above top secret into the Ultra and Q range to deal with security as far as the aliens are concerned. Only two presidents have, compl have had complete knowledge of the alien program, President Eisenhower and, and President Bush, because of his involvement with the Central Intelligence Agency. John Lear can corroborate that statement. The other thing, as I said, that President Reagan um, did not know what was going on, and he does uh, to a certain extent. But the President of the United States does not have a high enough clearance to know the whole thing. And it's interesting to note that above top secret, there's 38 levels of clearances. Uh, that's hard to buy, that the President, if somebody has a higher clearance than the President, he's not allowed to know who makes that decision. <laughs> if you think that's hard to buy, wait till you hear the rest of this stuff. Uh, I mean, who makes that decision? <laughs> oh, sorry, we can't let Ronald Reagan know about this stuff. Uh, it's an organization called MJ-12. It was established by President Truman by executive order in September 24, 1947. And uh, when President, uh, when uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected in 1952, he increased even the security requirements because he was military oriented. And the military uh, psych has a very uh, uh, disdain for elected officials. So he's the one that, that uh, effectively let the reins of power of the executive office slip from the president into the hands of MJ-12, who runs everything now. Our research team has amassed a mountain of documents that refer to or expressly describe UFO incidents and encounters. Jody? Headquarters, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, September, November, 1980. To whom this is addressed is deleted. It's a request for photographic interpretation by, again deleted, who provided negatives in film. The document describes trilateral insignia known to be on alien devices. Document shows tampering where NSA was changed to NASA before document was released under Freedom of Information Act. Document mentions high frequency beam pulses and implies that Benowitz was gaining alien data from these signals. Now, a document we have here that's a little more colorful than most records a shooting incident reported at Ellsworth Air Force Base. Now, this is an actual official complaint report from Ellsworth. It's filled out by the uh, guard duty officer. Helping hand is one of the code words, a security violation. Another one, covered wagon, security violation. A Paul D. Heinzman, a sergeant in the U.S. Air Force Wing Security Control. The report continues, Samuel Lime, Security Control, telephone WSC, and reported an OZ alarm activation at L9 that Lime sat number one. It's all military code, but it gets down to the incident was upgraded to a covered wagon per request of Captain Stokes. The report goes on to say that when these security officers responded to the alarm, a beam of light hit his rifle and it disintegrated, melted, burned his hands. They fired at aliens, as it says in the report, another beam of light. According to this, the, the two sailor or soldiers involved were so terrified, they called for more help. Not much question as to what happened as far as these guards were concerned, but now let's take a look and have Jody read the follow-up report. Yes, true. This document indeed is just as interesting as the one you just read. It is, however, the second part to that. It does, however, have deletion of name, to whom it was addressed, nor there, is there any signature upon it. Rake, the soldier in, in question, aimed his M16 rifle at the intruder and ordered him to stop. The intruder turned towards Rake and aimed an object at Rake which emitted a bright flash of intense light. The flash of light struck Rake's M16 rifle disintegrating the weapon and causing second and third degree burns to Rake's hands. Rake immediately took cover and concealment and radioed the situation to Jenkins, who in turn radioed a 1013 distress to line control. Jenkins challenged the two individuals, the two additional uh, alien individuals apparently, but they also refused to stop. 
Jenkins aimed and fired two rounds from his M16 rifle as well. One bullet struck one intruder in the back, and one bullet struck one intruder in the helmet. Both intruders fell to the ground. However, approximately 15 seconds later, both returned to an upright position and fired the same flashes of light at Jenkins. Jenkins took cover, and the light missed Jenkins. Now, the report goes on to finish and say, additional information. Rake was treated at the base hospital by a captain name who I cannot make out for second and third degree radiation burns to each hand. Rake was air vac to an unspecified location and Rake's M16 rifle could not be located at the site. And like many of the documents that we unearthed in our research, this document shows that people were sent different places so that they can't correlate their That's stories. Right. And now, Jody, something that keeps coming up and is of real interest is the reoccurring reference to MJ-12 and all of these documents we get. It's mentioned in the Truman document. Mm -hmm. It's mentioned throughout the documents that we've researched. I would like to ask our guest, Mr. Wilson, a few questions about these MJ-12 documents. Now, Mr. Wilson, how secret is this MJ-12? The MJ-12 organization itself is the uh, group of people that are actually the top 12 of a group of 32 individuals in a group known as the Jason Control Group started in the late 50s as a measure to take away the alien problem uh, procedure away from governments and take it outside the hands of governments. Meanwhile, our document trail appears to lead to a large-scale government cover-up. Yes, and as an example, here is another shooting incident report. Department of the Air Force, the Security Police Squadron. In January of 1978, I was stationed at McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. One evening, during the time frame of 0300 hours and 0500 hours, there was a number of UFO sightings in the area over the airfield and Fort Dix Army Camp. I am a security policeman and was on routine patrol at the time. New Jersey State Police and Fort Dix MPs were running code in the direction of Brownsville, New Jersey. A state trooper then entered Gate 5 at the rear of the base requesting assistance and permission to enter. I was dispatched and the trooper wanted access to the runway area which led to the very back of the airfield connected with a heavily wooded area which is part of the Dix training area. He informed me that a Fort Dix MP was pursuing a low-flying object which then hovered over his car. He described it as an oval shaped with no details and glowing with a bluish-green color. His radio transmission was cut off. At that time, in front of his police car appeared a thing, about four feet tall, grayish-brown, fat head, long arms, and slender body. The MP panicked and fired five rounds from his 45 caliber into the thing and one round into the object above. The object then fled straight up and joined with 11 others high in the sky. This we all saw, but didn't know the details at the time. Anyway, the thing ran into the woods towards our fence line, and they wanted to look for it. By this time, several, several patrols were involved. We found the body of the thing near the runway. It had apparently climbed the fence and died while running. Some absolutely incredible official documents. And here's another official document that makes reference to OSI, CR-44, local authorities, MJ-12, FBI, and emergency medical reaction teams. This document describes the office MJ-12-44, and in the document it says, no media exposure, no media exposure, send emergency react team. Once again, another reference to MJ-12. That's that government organization that supposedly does not exist. To recently in a Gulf Breeze, Florida, there was an incident that 132 folks say most certainly existed. Right you are. Even a television station was involved in analyzing the pictures and videos taken of this UFO sighting. Here is their report. Just a normal evening. My wife says she's got to run to the store. Anyway, I'm sitting at my desk. 
out the window I noticed something, a glow. I got up and walked around outside and looked. It just didn't look like a helicopter or an airplane. I realized that it was not something normal. I thought of calling the police. And I said, well, I better take a picture first. I had no feelings I was going to be, you know, hurt or anything. I took four shots and ran out of film. And again, in my mind, take some more pictures. I ran back in, took the last package of Polaroid film. I opened up and crammed it in there. Because the thing's flying around out there, you know? I mean, get it quick. It either saw me or whatever. Because it started coming. It altered its course. It started coming my direction. That was November 11th, 1987, about 6 o'clock in the evening. A Gulf Breeze resident who insists on remaining anonymous took these photographs. Charlie and Doris Summerby say they saw the same thing that night over East Bay. And suddenly, uh, Dory said, look. What's that, Sally? How'd you done? There were portholes. We saw portholes of light coming out of the portholes. And over the next three months, many more pictures would be taken. By different people. And videotapes, too. And I feel that there's absolutely no sign of a hoax, that the photographs are genuine, that the witnesses are telling the truth, and that this presents probably the best, uh, without any doubt, the best photographic evidence in, in 40 years of UFO investigation. And interestingly enough, all of this information was presented to the Air Force. The Air Force said they weren't particularly interested in any of it until such time as the TV station picked it up and ran it on the air. Then the Air Force became very interested, contacted all the people involved, and tried to confiscate all of the film, all of the information. When later contacted, the Air Force said, what sighting? What are you talking about? <laughs> of course, Drew, that is not the only occasion for that kind of government response. There was an incident, which is too lengthy for us to read in its entirety, happened in England in 1980, 11 years after the Air Force claims that they had no longer uh, had any interest or investigation in UFOs. This report is from the deputy base commander who was both present and has a tape recording of the incident. It happened over four peri uh, night, a period of four nights. And this is how it reads. Early in the morning of December 27th, approximately 300 hours, two U.S. Air Force security police patrolmen saw unusual lights outside the back gate at RAF Woodbridge. Thinking an aircraft might have crashed or have been forced down, they called for permission to go outside the gate to investigate. The on-duty flight chief responded and allowed three patrolmen to proceed on foot. The individuals reported seeing a strange glowing object in the forest. The object was described as being metallic in appearance and triangular in shape, approximately two to three meters across the base and approximately two meters high. It illuminated the entire forest with a white light. The object itself has a pulsating red light on top and back and blue lights underneath it. The object was hovering on or legs. As the police approached the object, it maneuvered through the trees and disappeared. The next day, three depressions, one and one-half feet deep, and seven inches in diameter were found where the object had been sighted on the ground. The following night, December 29th, the area was checked for radiation. Beta, gamma readings of 0.1 reams were recorded and peak reading in the three depressions and near the center of the triangle formed by the depressions. A nearby tree had moderate readings, and on the side of the tree toward the depressions. Later in the night, a red sunlight was seen through the trees again. It moved about and pulsated. At one point, it appeared to throw off glowing particles and then broke into five separate white objects and then disappeared. Immediately thereafter, three star-like objects were noticed in the sky, two objects to the north and one to the south, all of which were about 10 degrees off the horizon. The objects moved rapidly in sharp angular movement and displayed red, green, and blue lights. The objects to the north appeared to be elliptical throughout an 8 to 12 power lens. Then they turned to full circles. The objects to the north remained in the sky for an hour or more. The objects to the south remained visible for two to three hours 
and beam down a stream of light from time to time. Numerous individuals, including the undersigned, witnessed the activities listed in paragraphs 2 and 3. Charles L. Halt, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, Deputy Base Commander. And a very interesting side note to this is the fact that the U.S. Air Force disavowed that there was any information, physical evidence, tape recordings, a report of any kind. And uh, we, ba we have in our possession both a tape recording from a news report. We have transcription of tapes taken actually at the scene with uh, Deputy Base Commander Halt present and three to five different witnesses all of whom were at the site taking the readings and the photographs that the U U.S. Air Force claim do not exist. Thank you, Jody. That's another instance where the Air Force denies, 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 and discredits mm -hmm. people who come up with information. That's probably one of the big reasons that people are reluctant to give information mm -hmm. on UFOs, alien sightings, anything like that. What we are trying to do is provide a clearinghouse for all of the information that is available. We want you to send us any information you may have, and we will tell you how to do that later. In approximately 1948, the Air Force headed up Operation Blue Book, and I'd like right now to ask Mr. Wilson if he could possibly tell us something about that. As far as we can tell, Project Blue Book was a part of a disinformation uh, program that evolved after the United States discovered the uh, Air Force officer bodies and with the uh, alien bodies in the Roswell crash. The, the grudge part of it, the name grudge, was something that apparently evolved with General Hoyt Vandenberg, who wasn't particularly pleased with that top secret estimate of the situation, which was prepared by Project Sign in August 1948. In December 48, Sign was redesignated as Project Grudge, uh, primarily because of Hoyt's displeasure with the report. It wasn't convenient, it was a problem, and he wanted to have the material stop. So the answer was is to create a, a publicly uh, perceived version of an Air Force project with several officers involved one of them being Captain Edward Ruppelt, in order to uh, give the appearance to the public that the Air Force was looking into the matter. And at the end of that, to discredit the UFOs and close the project, which they apparently uh, told the public that they were going to do in 1969. All during this process, the top reports, the really interesting material, the really uh, gruesome stuff, about some of the abductions and crashes that they were finding was bypassed, uh, went bypassed uh, Project Blue Book and went into secret central intelligence agency and national security, security agency files. The Blue Book ended up with the unimportant stuff off the top, which they could easily convert and, and explain away as weather balloons and other atmospheric phenomena. Of late, it seems, there are more sightings, more people saying that they've seen flying saucers, UFOs. It's just kind of snowballed to the point where they can't keep it secret any longer? That's right. They, they not only cannot keep that secret, but uh, there are military secrets, and government secrets seems to be a very fleeting thing. And it was once said that were four people gathered together to conspire, uh, three are fools, and one is a government agent. Briefly describe the cloak of secrecy surrounding the information. You have to understand that here we were, uh, just coming out of a war, and here we had an alien crash, and alien beings, and dead humans, and a real big problem. An alien uh, craft, and alien beings, is a big culture shock. They were worried about a lot of people going crazy. And, uh, there was one early test, which is when Orson Welles did his War of the Worlds thing, his Mars thing on the radio. That was he was a rain, he was asked to do that by the government. Uh, so they still felt that that was a common mindset, and they they couldn't tell people what was going on. It was to know the truth would destroy uh, religions, upset economic systems, and in general, they proceeded to cause general havoc uh, about the whole thing. 
are the things that they're doing now is they're trying to acclimate the public. They've been trying to do that for several years, having movies like E.T. And then eventually, when they found out that they could not stop what apparently was an alien timetable, they started coming out with the series V, depending, uh, depicting aliens as reptilians, uh, carnivorous reptilians. A lot of these movies depict a little piece of the truth, trying to psychologically acclimate the public before events soon to come, apparently, um, uh, force themselves on the American public, uh, the public and the world at large. Journalist Linda Howe has written the book and produced a documentary film on the subject of mutilations. Let's take a look at a minute or two of what her film discovered. In northeastern Colorado, another favorite spot for the mutilators. Tex Graves, former sheriff of Logan County, insists the 93 mutilated carcasses he investigated were not natural deaths. Now, the very first one we had was southwest of Sterling. Now, when we first looked at it, it was just unbelievable uh, that you could take an animal and do this too without uh, leaving some kind of track, some kind of evidence behind, such as uh, cigarette butts, matches, handprints, footprints, but there was nothing. Uh, the animal looked almost horrible, and it was something that uh, I didn't really want to believe then. And there was, uh, we probably had, had five or six others before I, I really did believe something strange was going on. We had one up north where we believed the animal was paralyzed and was alive when it was being mutilated. An eye and an ear, the uh, tongue, the rectal area was taken out, but the animal dug a hole with its head, but none of the other parts of the body moved, not even the legs. Six north of town on a very hard pasture, almost like hard brick. We found tripod marks 12 inches across. Now, the tripod marks were 14 feet apart. We found one set that had gone in the ground roughly 8 inches. And it would take a good post hole digger or, or shovel to dig in like this. It indicated something very heavy had set down in this area, yet there was no tracks leading from it nor to it. Almost nightly when this was going on, uh, we could pick out a very brilliant, huge, brilliant light in the sky. And we had a newsman take pictures of it with a very high-powered lens, but all we got out of this was the movement of it and the light showing very brilliant. Several times we observed a no smaller lights come out of this aircraft and then come down toward Earth. And when it would move, it could move up and down, backwards, forwards, travel very rapidly. And after a while, these smaller lights would join up with the larger one, and then they'd disappear. Lou Gerardo is the chief investigator for the district attorney's office in Trinidad, Colorado. Extraterrestrials are the ones mutilating animals. What do you think the implications are then for this planet? Throughout the mutilations, all of us involved have been concerned with the possibility of the mutilations going from animals to human beings, understandably. Thank God to this point it hasn't happened. Uh, whatever they're doing with the portions of these animals they are taking, I haven't the slightest idea. There's a reason for it. It's not haphazard. There's a pattern to it. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a, uh, a wait-and-see game. What else can we do if we do have beings from outer space doing this with the capabilities to do things like this? Uh, what can we as a human race do? Now that is bizarre. In looking at this videotape, it's amazing. Those are surgical cuts. They're perfectly clean. Yes, you don't see cuts like that at the butcher. Uh, <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, some of the interesting things about the mutilations as well, uh, as the photos, uh, uh, the video describes, is that the incisions are very clean. There is no blood. Uh, it is done in a, an advanced surgical procedure. And one of the most interesting uh, things is that there is blood drained completely from the animal, no sign of blood, yet there is no vascular or organ collapse 
from that, something we could not do in our own surgical hospitals. Yes, so I, know, I know you've done an awful lot of research and reading on this subject, and I think you've confirmed that the different procedures that were done, the vascular system doesn't collapse, there's no bleeding, the, uh, the edges of the incisions are, are symmetrical. The, mm -hmm. We don't have the technology to do that, even if it were done surgically. No, the, the uh, instruments with the serrated edges, and it's almost as if something as, as uh, if an apple were cored, it is that simple, it is that clean, and there is not a mess, there is not anything that you would really anticipate to find when you think of something being butchered. This story reflects the need for more research and more people to come forward with what they know. Jody has a special guest in our studio today, the head of UFO Investigations. I would like to introduce Mr. Richard Harris, president of UFO Investigations, Inc. Mr. Harris, why don't you tell us a little bit about the organization? Well, how it started was we had gotten some anonymous information and tips from sources that came through myself and our legal staff. At that point, we got us interested, as you can tell from what you've done here. And we put an ad in a local paper for people to tell us of their experiences or any information they may have. And lo and behold, what we started getting in was some really highly credible uh, governmental bodies that were supplying information to us, uh, anonymous. Then people on the local level, they started checking their local newspapers, and they started checking the, uh, the law enforcement agencies. They started bringing forth information, and we've gone, grown now to a national organization, and hopefully we'll be international before long, because we can't hardly stop it. We can't keep up. How do you go about gathering your information? A lot of it comes from the Freedom of Information Act, through the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and... A lot of it comes via people such as Mr. Wilson, who are highly mm -hmm. credible uh, researchers. Most of them have been doing it for 20 years. And then we get all the way down to the grassroots level, where people are, have actually checked in with their local newspapers, their uh, local law enforcement agencies, mm -hmm. and uh, we compile it all together. And the locals augment and supplement the, the researchers. Surprisingly enough, most of the time, the, the professional researchers are within the government body themselves. They will not come out in the open. Uh, a funny story, a lady at the bank, she says, I had uh, this UFO experience. Everywhere you go, everyone has a UFO experience. So she proceeded to tell me that she had seen a UFO, and she said, but don't tell anybody, because I work at the bank now. Uh, we're, we're really looking to be a clearinghouse for information. There's so much more. Uh, that's out there that people can let us know about if they'll call or write us. So if if any of your viewers have information that, as you well know, help us mm -hmm. all the time, they can send it to 2929 East Desert Inn Road, number 21131, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89121. And we can compile it and we'll get it to the public. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Harris, and I hope that the viewers, whether it's a story about their own experience or sightings or government people or whatever, respond, and I wish you all the best. For whatever reason the government has used for covering up this information, you would think that over the span of 40-plus years, they might have tried at one time or another to bring this information to the public. John Lear has some thoughts on this subject. Um, April 25th, 1964, was the first official communication between our government and the aliens. Three saucers landed there by prearranged agreement. It was filmed uh, by five high-speed cameras, 68,000 feet of film. The reason we know this is because in 1972, when they were going to release the first information about UFOs to the public, a very uh, knowledgeable writer, his name was Robert Emmenager, was asked by the agency to write a documentary, which he did. And they were going to release this thing, and we had the whole history of the UFOs, and the last part of the documentary was the, the footage of the saucer landing. But in 1973, when they're ready to go, we had Watergate, and they were faced with two problems. Number one is they didn't think the public could handle two traumatic experiences at the same time, and number two, they thought that the public would perceive these, this picture of aliens and spacecraft as a ploy by Nixon to divert the attention from Watergate. So they shelved it. The documentary actually came out. It was narrated by Rod Serling, but instead of the real footage, they had uh, drawings of these 
uh, flying saucer landing, and they said, uh, Rod Serling says, let's consider an event that could possibly happen in the future or may have already happened. It seems almost certain that if other beings more advanced than ourselves do inhabit other sectors of the universe, then it's quite probable there will come that day, that moment in time, when official contact will be made. Let's look at an incident that might happen in the future, or perhaps could have happened already. The premise is that contact is made by extraterrestrial beings with representatives of the United States Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base in the deserts of New Mexico. The day is clear. It's about 5.32 a.m. at Holloman Air Force Base. Traffic light. One recon plane is on the field ready for takeoff when Sergeant Mann is given a report of an approaching unidentified craft. Yeah, Bill, uh, no, nothing on the board. I'll repeat it again. situation or is it hypothetical as a person involved in television production most of my adult life I have some serious questions about this Serling one hour program that we just saw bits of now I have seen the entire show in the very beginning of the show there are two Academy Award winning actors featured Serling never used name talent in any of his productions it was always a strong script with unknown talent there also was an appearance by a Department of Defense spokesman. Rod Serling in the Pentagon doing a UFO feature <laughs> at a time when the government said UFOs didn't exist. Then, after this very well done, very expensive, 
piece of videotape, we go to a very rushed, thrown together segment that shows you loudspeakers and microphones and clocks and telephones. The two pieces don't seem to fit together. It appears as if the first part of the show was done, the last part had to be thrown together in a few minutes. Makes you wonder. Now, Mr. Wilson, you have information about this particular segment on the Rod Serling program. There has been some analysis of this particular film. It's suspected and uh, uh, pretty well demonstrated as far as we can determine that the government had a plan in process during this particular point in time to bring some very superficial information about alien presence to the minds of the American public. However, in the, in the middle of the production, certain incidents that occurred allegedly at an alien base here, uh, where military personnel were killed, uh, forced uh, a rethink of the government alien relationship and postponed, especially in terms of the political climate of the time, any kind of revelation to the general public. Now, we've seen an awful lot of documentation, especially documents that refer to this MJ-12. MJ-12 starts with the Truman document and runs all the way through a variety of name changes to the present day. We've seen an awful lot of information that would indicate there is a cover-up, that more information is needed. We would like to have your information. If you have had any kind of an experience, if you know of someone that's had an experience, maybe you've got information that you've been afraid to tell anybody, please send it to us. We want to become the International Clearinghouse. We can put it all together and maybe make some sense of it. Now, this is only the first of several tapes that we're going to bring you on specific parts of this UFO story. Well, Jody, thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you on this project. Well, thank you, too. It's been a great pleasure working with you as well. I'd like to thank all of the viewers as well, and I'm hoping that we hear from a lot of you. We're looking for more information all the time, and every video and every project, I hope, will be better and better, and we need you for that. Thanks for watching, and I hope we see you again soon. UFO Investigations invites you to become a part of the movement. Order your What Cover Up or Believe t-shirt today. The t-shirts are top quality, guaranteed washable, and make you a part of the movement. Order yours today. Send $7.95 plus $2.50 postage and handling for each t-shirt to UFO Investigations, 2929 East Desert Inn Road, number 21131, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89122. Your t-shirts will be shipped immediately. Much of the information in UFO Investigations video, the cover-up, comes directly from the book by famous UFO investigator and author Richard K. Wilson and Sylvan Burns. Order your unabridged copy of the cover-up. Over 20 years of UFO research in one book. Send $14.95 plus $3.50 postage and handling to UFO Investigations. 2929 East Desert Inn Road, number 21131, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89121. This has been Volume 1 of UFO Investigations. This report, The Cover-Up. Watch for the next volume in our series of reports titled Abductions. This has been a presentation of UFO Investigations Incorporated. All rights reserved.